Hello, everyone. This is very humbling to be here and share a little bit of my background with you guys. Hopefully, it's going to be interesting based on the things I have heard about you. I heard you had a lot of fun with the Raspberry Pi, some of you. Some of you had fun while walking around the computer museum downstairs, right? So I've been through similar experiences, but in, in different places. So hopefully, the things I have been through will inspire you to things you may do in the future. So uh, I know the event's called, it's Design, Code, and Build, but then I also want to encourage you to not only embrace the framework, the mindset, but then uh, have in mind that you can do what you want. Right? So you have your own uniqueness, your own set of skills and interests that make you unique, and then don't be afraid or ashamed of being different than others around you. Right? So this is me, well, in a slightly different place than here. So based on how big my smile is over there, you may assume that I'm from a place in which winter is taken as granted, right? But then it wasn't until two years ago that I saw snow for the first time. So this is how crazy my transition was. Uh, I'm from Brazil, from this town called Salvador. And as you may have noticed, there isn't too much snow over there, right? <laughs> so uh, Salvador is the first capital of Brazil. How many of you have heard about Brazil? Cool. <laughs> what is Brazil known for, for you guys? <laughs> Nice. Anything else, maybe? Excellent. Well, the recent one was a little bit. Anyways. <laughs> cool. Uh, my hometown is known also specifically. So Brazil is, is a big country. Had immigration patterns from multiple places across the centuries. And then the oldest, play, oldest part of it is my hometown. So my hometown has huge influence from the African roots and African descendants. So it was the biggest hub of immigration across the country uh, back then. So Salvador is known for its music, for its food to be very spicy, heavy, compared to the other regions of Brazil. And then we are all about connecting and partying with each other. We are extremely social in my hometown, even more than Brazilians in general. And then we are so cool that we had a special visit back then in the 90s. Do you know who this guy is? <laughs> nice. Yes. So he recorded a video clip merging the pop culture from the US back then, and our music uh, genre back then. So this is where I grew up, but this is not where I got introduced to technology. So it wasn't until I started to visit my mom's office. She worked in a power generation company. And uh, one day I stopped by there, and she had this, she had this interesting machine over, his, over her desk that I started to ask, so what do you do with this? It's all shiny and beautiful, but then there's a keyboard and what's up with it? And she told me, well, there are some commands you can run, but you can also actually tell it to run commands in a specific order, depending on your input. Then, well, can you write a calculator? Because I was very bad at math. So can I bring it to school with me <laughs> during exams? And she said, well, no, but you can still write a calculator. Uh, it was a little cumbersome, not so fun initially. I was around eight or nine years old. I didn't have one at home, so it was hard to keep up with codes in it. But it wasn't until she showed me that you can play a game with it, they started, things started to change. Who here likes video games? Nice, you're not alone. <laughs> so the first game, though, we played uh, was chess. So I didn't know the rules. I didn't know how to control it. They had a, spe a specific set of instructions to move pieces around. And the rules were a little bit unknown to me. And the computer always won over me, like always. And one day, actually, this is how I tried to make it fun for me. I found that you can actually change the sides of the computer. So if you're starting with the black pieces, then at some point you can just move over and then tell, no, you are with the black pieces now. So then the fun I had was basically to get the computer to win over me, and right before, just move sides and try to win. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm still bad at chess. <laughs> um, a little later, though, I got introduced to a slightly fancier machine. So can you guys tell me the difference between this one and the previous one I, I showed you guys? No? What would you say? This one, like, this one is what, sorry? Like less big. Mm-hmm. So this one is uh, slightly smaller, a little bit more lean. 
Does it have something else that the other doesn't? Exactly. So the mouse, oh, I'm sorry. We were going to say the mouse as well? Yes, that's a beautiful part of it as well that I'm going to go over. So this was, although the computers were cool when I got first introduced to them, they were not as magical. But then when I saw this, a device in which you could move, this was before touch screens, before smartphones even. I could move a device on, device on the table and see it moving on this wide screen, all colorful and beautiful. Do you guys know how this works? Oh, any, any guesses? Exactly. So internally, it has at least the ones from old school. I don't think these are around anymore. You have this rubber ball inside that would move these two axes of uh, sensors over here. So as you walk over with your mouse, then you would roll one axis, and then it would keep flashing these lights over here of the sensor and telling the computer, hey, you walked one step, and then another step, another step in this direction, while the other one would tell if you moved on this direction or not. So if you combine the movements, you can tell the computer, move two steps this way, move two other steps this way, and then move diagonally. So then, by then, I figured, well, I think it's cool to open up magic around me, I think, as you just did with mouse. So I went to school, and then I figured, all right, I'm going to tinker, be tinkering with hardware. But at the same time, I like to play guitar a lot. Do any of you play guitars? Nice. Do you know who this guy is? So this guy is called Joe Satriani. He's a guitar player, solo guitar player from San Francisco that back in the 80s became very famous in Brazil. So back then we didn't have YouTube, neither other play music that would get access to music so easily to us. So we would rely on TV channels to present music to us. So he wrote a song that became the TV theme of a B TV show back in Brazil. So in the midst of all that, I played guitar, I tinkered with hardware, I liked a little bit of physics. What should I go to school for? Right? This is a pretty hard question. Do you guys have any idea what you go to university for? Oh. STEM? Cool. Oh, OK. So you have a pretty clear idea already, which is very rare. Oh, sorry? Yeah. OK, that's a, a good start. And that's what I was trying to do back then. What's going to come up? What's the knowledge that I will acquire that will become useful for me as an adult, especially when acquiring a job? I still had no idea. So I basically tried to pick the course that was closer to the things I had uh, experienced while young, mostly hardware. And my parents worked, again, in a power generation company. But then don't forget the guitar aspect of it. I like to create stuff also. Create songs is somewhat similar to creating solutions. You imagine, and then what if we do a device that you move over the table and you see the course are moving? Then I decided to go for this one. So in my head, once I got in, I was going to be spending five years doing this in the laboratory building stuff. This is very cool, right? At least for me. <laughs> However, it wasn't like that at all. So this was probably the biggest wall life presented to me, right? I said, well, I'm going to be here for five years. I'd rather get through it. I have probably 100 of other students with me going through the same harsh path. Let's just get through it. But let's find some fun. So do you guys like robots? Yeah. Nice. Have you ever, oh, OK, you do too. Uh, have you ever built a robot? No? Oh, did you know that robots actually have a code of ethics? Do you know what that means? So robots cannot be used for any purpose. So there are three laws that Isaac Asimov wrote and conjectured, so then we could always use robots in a meaningful way for human beings. The first law is robots cannot harm human beings. The second law is uh, robots have to obey human orders, unless it conflicts with the first law. It feels like coding, right? The third law is the robot has to fight for its, its existence unless it conflicts with law number two and number one. So 
Does it sound fun to code this down? <laughs> Excellent. So there was a group at school that, uh, yeah, a cat comb, <laughs> that created uh, this um, competition amongst robots. So robots can't harm other robots unless they're not harming any other human beings. So we had specific different groups that would build their own robots, and then each one would have specific um, weapons to fight with each other. Then I was specifically my team responsible for writing the code that would communicate the radio controllers to the rest of the weapons and the uh, robot itself, I mean, the, the motors. That's how I kind of tried to find fun while going to school. Well, once I got all of this knowledge, all right, about time, I got a degree, so now what? I've been postponing this question for five years. <laughs> so I tried to then look back and see, all right, I like hardware, I like writing code, I like creating stuff, I like music, although music's not very directly related here. So I got a job at a company that was writing operating systems. So do any of you know what an operating system is? Huh. So some of you have played with a Raspberry Pi today, right? So when you first got introduced to it, it was basically powered down, and then you had a monitor, a keyboard, mouse, and that was it. But once you plugged it in, everything, all the devices, and you powered it on, then something came up on the screen. Were you able to type things and then see on the screen? No? no? <laughs> Maybe I can help you afterwards. Then do you, could you move the mouse and then still type? Nice. So at the very core of the hardware, there is a specific piece of code that orchestrates all of these events. So it gets the mouse events, the keyboard events, shows on the screen. So let's fast forward a little bit to a little bit more sophisticated device and dedicated, the iPod. So when you're listening to your music on the iPod, then you want to select the next one. You would scroll around and then select a song or just move between album titles. Those events have to be coordinated with the sound card that sends sound to your headphones. So the things cannot be interrupted, right? So this piece of code is called the operating system. So the same, and this piece of code happens to have to run in your cell phones, in desktops, it's the core layer of it. My job was to make sure that my company's hardware got in this uh, operating system over here, the Linux. Are you familiar with Linux? Cool. So for some of you that may not be aware of uh, its history, Linux started as a project from a guy called Linus Torvalds while he was at school in Finland. And then he said, I'm going to write one from scratch. This looks fun. But I'm not going to write by myself. I'm going to throw out there on the internet and ask for help from others that may have a similar interest. So then uh, Linux has been written the same way since then. That was around 92. And up to now, only around 2% of the code actually is just Linux. Uh, Given it was so widely famous, this um, piece of uh, this operating system was strategic for my company to support our hardware. So my job was basically to sit down, write code all the way through, making sure the hardware run there. Very fun. I did that for five years and a half, but still, I was feeling that I was disconnected from uh, from the real people benefits from the code I was writing. Remember, I'm from a town in which we like to party and then be social with each other. We connect, to look in the eye, we smile, right? So then, this became another layer of uh, my professional life. So first, I had to have fun. Afterwards, when I went to school, I figured, well, I have to do hard work as well. It's not gonna be easy. And then, you figure afterwards, it's never gonna be easy. But it's totally fine, it's part of the fun as well. The third, I went to feel useful and then could see the impact on others as well. So I tried many different industries to go to investment banks, management consulting, technical sales. Would you pick any of these three? No, right? I had to pick one. <laughs> so I picked technical sales. I mean, I got offered the opportunity to do so with technical sales. But then even though I was talking to customers, selling them computers, at the end of the day, my office looked like this. Do you see anyone smiling here? See, like, it's kind of boring, even though it looks cool for a movie, maybe, if you watch, I don't know, The Matrix. But I still miss that little part. 
So I started looking for jobs again. Back in the previous endeavor, I applied for jobs at Google. I didn't get them. Then I acquired more experience on the field. Then I tried it again based on a friend's advice. And then I got a job there. Cool. Uh, this was way closer to me, but it was way far removed from hardware. I had to learn everything from scratch again. It felt as if I went to university again. So all right, it seems life is going to be this little cycle of you put yourself to find uh, something more meaningful to you, and then a challenge will be presented. You overcome it, and just do it again and again. So for you, what is Google known for? Internet. The internet? OK. Apps, internet. internet. OK. That's a good one. Exactly. So do you know how the search engine works? Cool. Okay, okay, it's okay. <laughs> um, you search what you want, and then you enter it, and then you, there's so many things to like click on. Cool, but then how does Google know so much? Um, they take like information from different sources, and then they like um, put it all on one software. So then when you like input something, it's going to show a ton of things that are related to your search. That's amazing. That's, I mean, it should work to us. <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, this is exactly how it works. So I brought a video uh, that explains how Google managed to go over so many documents, as he's mentioned. And he's going to do a much better job than I would do, because he has all these fancy like pictures going on. So let's watch that. Hi, my name is Matt Cutts. I'm an engineer in the quality group at Google, and I'd like to talk today about what happens when you do a web search. The first thing to understand is that when you do a Google search, you aren't actually searching the web. You're searching Google's index of the web, or at least as much of it as we can find. We do this with software programs called spiders. Spiders start by fetching a few web pages. Then they follow the links on those pages and fetch the pages they point to and follow all the links on those pages, and fetch the pages they link to, and so on, until we've indexed a pretty big chunk of the web, many billions of pages stored across thousands of machines. Now, suppose I want to know how fast a cheetah can run. I type in my search, say, cheetah running speed, and hit return. Our software searches our index to find every page that includes those search terms. In this case, there are hundreds of thousands of possible results. How does Google decide which few documents I really want? By asking questions, more than 200 of them, like, how many times does this page contain your keywords? Do the words appear in the title, in the URL, directly adjacent? Does the page include synonyms for those words? Is this page from a quality website, or is it low quality, even spammy? What is this page's page rank? That's a formula invented by our founders, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, that rates a web page's importance by looking at how many outside links point to it and how important those links are. Finally, we combine all those factors together to produce each page's overall score and send you back your search results about half a second after you submit your search. At Google, we take our commitment to delivering useful and impartial search results very seriously. We don't ever accept payment to add a site to our index, update it more often, or improve its ranking. Let's take a look at my search results. Each entry includes a title, a URL, and a snippet of text to help me decide whether this page is what I'm looking for. I also see links to similar pages, Google's most recent stored version of that page, and related searches that I might want to try next. And sometimes, along the right and at the top, I'll see ads. We take our advertising business very seriously as well, both our commitment to deliver the best possible audience for advertisers and to strive to only show ads that you really want to see. We're very careful to distinguish your ads from regular search results. And we won't show you any ads at all if we can't find any that we think will help you find the information you're looking for, which in this case 
the cheetah's top running speed is more than 60 miles an hour. Thanks for watching. I hope this made Google a little bit more understandable. Did you guys know the cheetah speed? Ah. Yeah, exactly. Couldn't hear you? Oh yeah, so it's around that range, 60, 65, 70. And then there are actually way more questions you can ask Google to help you out, even if it's due to your curiosity or if you want to find some, some other business on the web. So I'm going to jump over to what I do for work there at Google. So we use the search infrastructure to surface businesses, small businesses and bigger businesses there as well. So let's say you want to get a new sneakers, right? So how can you actually search for multiple items that are from stores that maybe they're not necessarily accessible to you or close to you? Or maybe there are sneakers out there that you didn't even know that existed. So my job is to actually look for all of these documents he mentioned, and then the difference between the noble search ads and the shopping ads is that the retailers, the businesses, they have to send a list of products to us. So when you click on one of these links, you have to make sure that first, the item is there, second, the price is right, because otherwise you're gonna tell your parents a wrong price, and they're gonna be a little upset. <laughs> so, and also, uh, that the item is there in the store, available for you as well. Uh, so my job is uh, frame it as a sales engineer or a product techno technology manager as well. And I finally found a sweet spot between sales, so an audience that's not necessarily technically savvy, and engineers, and I can translate the message between the two. I can instrument sales to help this business on board with Google Shopping and come back to engineers and then, hey, what about if you build this feature this way or this way? So I get to write a little bit of code, write a little bit of documents, and talk a little bit as well. So you may be asking then, Raj, this is a business. Uh, you talked about you know, making impact in people's lives. So this is still in my radar. So I got another video, way shorter, about what impact you can actually make on someone's life when it comes down to Google Shopping. When I was a kid, I actually started a stationary business. I stenciled out all of these greeting cards. It was called Wubana Cards, and it was this picture of a monkey holding a banana, and I used to write Wu in the middle, and that was my logo. I'm Chris Wu. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Paper Culture. So when we started Paper Culture, we set out to build a company that was a reflection of how we dreamed of the world being. We provide environmentally friendly stationery with modern design. We do that by using only 100% recycled paper. And then we plant a tree with every order. And we've planted over 300,000 trees to date. I think one of the toughest challenges for us as a small business is that we don't have the brand of some of our larger competitors. The biggest challenge is finding the new customers. Google Shopping gives us the ability to present our products on Google Search in a visual way, right next to our much bigger competitors. When people see a design that they've fallen in love with and they click on that, then their likelihood to purchase from us is so much higher because they've already said, hey, I love that design. And a small business can compete with any business based on design instead of based on brand. That's why we love Google Shopping. It's a huge way that we acquire new customers in our business. At the end of the day, paper culture is successful when our customers find incredible joy, not just with the products that they receive, but when they start understanding, believing, and sharing the mission. And I think that's the joy of what we do. So this jump between the technology and then affecting someone's lives is actually what I enjoy the most about what I do for work. And then each one's path is different. It doesn't necessarily mean I have to do exactly the same what I did. But I think the challenges can be slightly similar. I mean, you can abstract them. So I like this quote a lot from Ralph um, Waldo Emerson, which is, well, if I may ask, what do you think that this means? So 
the beauty of it is open to interpretation based on your personal experiences. For me, actually, some of you may have faced a similar situation at the maze uh, today, right? There were all walls placed to you. Would you go left or right or over it? I heard. <laughs> so the same happens in life as well. Sometimes challenges will be placed to you. Some people will say that uh, this is not the right thing to you. But then if you keep following your vision, your path, and your passion, and even though walls may be presented, you could just go around them or over them and learn from the experience. Uh, this applies to me uh, a lot, and then I hope this, uh, this was helpful. Thank you. <laughs> oh. All right, so we have lots of time for questions. Thank you so much. That was a great Thank talk. Thank you. And so, uh, students, raise your hands if you've got a question. I know you've got to have at least one. That was great. Going back to every wall is a door. I think it's um, the wall, like you can, uh, there. if you go in one path, it will lead you somewhere. So. I agree. Thank you. All right. How did you get to Google? Uh, so Google has uh, an interview process. And for an outside, it may, be a, it may be a little scary. But I had a friend that has had been through the process before. And then I relate that experience a lot with, again, being from my hometown, having friends, just by connecting with people. And then this person helped me a lot on understanding, I mean, what are the roles, how the roles would relate to me, because the person knew me as well. So she told me about this role, and then applied on the website and submitted my curriculum, showing robot wars pictures. I'm not kidding. <laughs> and then uh, my experience with computers and sales, and then that's, um, that's how I got the job. We've got one over here at Purple. Uh, where are you? Where are you? Okay. So, um, like, what, so like, what do you do at Google? Like, do you like just program or do you do like specific things? So I mostly listen to, so there are three steps. Let's put in three steps in my job. The first step is to interview the sales teams, the ones that are actually talking to the customers. So sometimes customers call Google and then talk with someone on our side. Then I say, hey, uh, what are the hard parts of your day? I mean, what is it that's not working for you in Google Shopping? And then they share with me situations in which they had a hard time onboarding a customer. Based on that, that comes to, down to phase two, which is let's think of something that can help them. So let's say that, uh, create a little analogy here, that your problem is getting to another city. So right now, you only have a way to go there, which is walking. Walking takes a long time. It's tiring. It's cumbersome. What if you come up with a bike? Maybe with a bike, you get that faster. And then I jump to the third step, which is let's build the bike. Once we agree, that's the best solution. And then at my job, that would be coding a program or a tool internally for sales to use to make their jobs easier and then make it easier for customers to use Google Shopping. Does that make sense? When did you leave Brazil and come to America? Oh, good question. Uh, that happened two years and a half ago. So I, was, I left my hometown to go to Sao Paulo, which is in the southeast of Brazil, and then has a very different culture as compared to uh, my hometown. That's where I went to school. Then I worked in the computers job, in the, the one with Kernel. And then that's where I got the sales job. And then that's where I started at Google as well, which was four years ago. And I worked there for one year and a half. And then there was another role that uh, got available here. And then a friend referred me to that role. Again, hometown friends. <laughs> and then <laughs> I moved here. Yeah, Straight to California. This is the only place I have lived in, in the US. We've got one over here at Purple again. OK. <laughs> um, do you like Google? Uh, you tell me. <laughs> I do. I do like it a lot. And then um, I will expand your question to probably why do I like working there? And um, I've had great experiences at previous employers as well. And there specifically, 
I connect with the people a lot. I think every day there's a new story and new experience that I hear from someone else that enriches not only the job, and then we manage to find healthy ways to disagree to come up with a greater solution. So it's very well respected for you to think differently. So. Did you lay? <laughs> it's okay, I'm nervous as well. He may not like, look like it. <laughs> no, come on, it's okay. She wants to know if you left your family in Brazil or were they able to come with you? Oh, that's an excellent question. I think about it um, quite often. So my family is still in my hometown. So I get to come back every six months to Brazil to visit them and then spend Christmas or some other holidays. And uh, I'm still, given I moved here only two years and a half ago, uh, I'm still figuring how to get my family and then my work all together. Got one back here at Purple again. Um, did you suggest uh, build a code design? Oh, this program? Yeah. No. <laughs> I was just invited. They did. You had a question? So, uh, what do you think is the next step after Google? Whoa. What do you think I should do? I like playing guitars. I like technology. What would you do? Maybe become a guitar player? No? Because I actually consider it. <laughs> so in all honesty, um, I don't know yet. Uh, I'm always trying to, so for example, I had a band until not too long ago, and then I was managing going to work and also growing the band, so we have stuff online already. We recorded an album, but then I think there's a more efficient way to use both, both sides. So I'm sorry, I don't have a very good answer yet. <laughs> We've got one over here at purple again. Over this way, yes. Oh. When is your birthday? <laughs> uh, it's next week, actually. It's uh, March 2nd. <laughs> really? Ah, yeah. oh, March awesomeness. <laughs> nice. Why'd you leave Brazil? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I think even when young in my hometown, there's a particular side of it that I like a lot. I also wanted to get into technology and explore the world. So, and that has been the case since then. I moved to very many, very different cities in Brazil. My sales job got me to travel around Latin America a lot. So I think leaving Brazil was just part of the process of expanding it and exploring out there. And um, the, the jobs here, specifically in my team, were closer to things that I wanted to do. And then I said, well, I'm going to live in a different country, different language, I have a different culture, I have different songs, different food. Sounds fun, so I did it. All right, so those were a lot of really great questions, and I see that some of you also have additional questions. There will be plenty of time. He's going to hang out with us for lunch, so you can ask him then. But for now, I'm going to wrap up with one question. So you gave some really great words of advice, and my question for you is, what can you tell someone who, similar to you, has a lot of different interests, but they don't really know yet what to do with their future? Uh, I would ask, uh, well, there's a lot of trial and error. So I try a lot of low risk stuff. So I tried robot wars, I tried playing guitar at home to figure how much you like it. So for example, while at school, I tried to, I think, I thought I was good at graphical design, so I did the freelancing at graphical design, and then I saw that I did not like it, nor I was good at it. <laughs> so I think at the end of the day, you should ask yourself why 
do like that stuff. So for me, with music and coding, I think the common ground was I like to build stuff, to have an idea, see it in my head, and see it in real life. So I think uh, that framework should work for you guys. I don't know. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Let's give one last round of applause and cheer for Raj. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is very cool.